This Architecture podcast is sponsored by Adelaide. Remember where's Waldo? He was 100% viewable, but still awfully hard to find. Your digital ads are like Waldo, viewable, but in a sea of distraction. You need to move beyond viewability. Adelaide helps brands like Mars, Audi, Colgate, and the NBA measure media quality and drive better performance by optimizing campaigns programmatically with attention data. Adelaide's metric, AU, is available at nearly every major DSP and SSP, making it easy to leverage attention metrics. Get a free Waldo was viewable t-shirt at adelaidemetrics.com slash Waldo. Welcome to the Marketecture Podcast. I'm Harry Toparo. I'm joined by Eric Franchi and our special guest today, Alex Code, the Privacy Sandbox Product Manager at Google. I'm very excited about this episode. This is the Sandbox episode. Alex, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I think I've listened to every single episode, and I will have trouble listening to this one because it's hard to listen to your own voice. Hard to but, listen uh, to your own voice. Uh, great, is it fa- great to be here. Is it fair to say you have the worst job at AdTech? I actually chose this job. Uh, I would hope so, you chose this job. It's not slavery. Let's Google yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Right? I, I definitely would say it is a challenging job in ad tech. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. It's one of those uh, bad week to quit sniffing glue kind of situation. Great reference. <laughs> uh, so quick housekeeping. Uh, as we discussed last week, the Marketecture now has a newsletter I'm writing every week. So the first episode came out this week. It was about our interview with Autogen as well as curation. Uh, I think that was a really good one. A lot of people contacted me later to say it was an area where they wanted to learn a lot. The Autogen interview will remain free until Monday morning, at which time it'll go behind the paywall. All right, let's dive in. So we could talk about the sandbox probably for an hour or two, uh, but we don't have that much time. So the way I want to structure the conversation is we're going to start with factual conversation. What is it? Product questions I have, et cetera. And then we'll kind of transition into what I call philosophical or strategic conversations. Just this week, the IAB put out a very long uh, critique. Uh, we want to cover that. And I also want to cover some of the other conversations happening around. So let's start with the facts. We're at 1% of Chrome has the sandbox active and has cook- third-party cookies turned off. The plan is to go to 100% in the second half of this year, but that is dependent on sort of the approval or consent of the CMA which is the UK regulatory body. Is that all accurate? That is all accurate. Uh, Have you given any more guidance as to what second half of the year means? There's some people who are saying, oh, there's no way Google would do this the week before Thanksgiving or Christmas, Black Friday, et cetera. Is any of that a consideration for when the actual dial would move? Yeah, so we're absolutely continue to listen to folks who have, have raised this, right? I think the facts surrounding, you know, the, the, the timeline are all out there right now. So you mentioned the UK Competition and Markets Authority. Part of those commitments say that going into the second half of the year, uh, we'll enter a 60-day standstill period in which the CMA, as I understand it, will be looking at test results and other things that have been raised throughout the course of, of development of Privacy Sandbox. And the standstill really just means, hey, you know, Google's said we're moving forward with this, but we're going to say pause for a second while we evaluate this stuff. They reserve the right to add another 60 days on top of the initial 60 days. I can't tell you what they're going to do, but that that's in there. That's public information. So I think that's sort of that's what we're working with. Right. We've definitely gotten the feedback that like, hey, regardless of the date that you start, the ramp up, it would be great to know kind of what the what the ramp up plan looks like. So we're taking that into account. Obviously, like we need to be thoughtful about how we respond there. So yeah, hopefully that helps. Yeah. So there's a pen- clarify a little bit. So Google has a pencils down date, which will be a, unclear. Will you announce when that date starts when you've submitted for the 60 day quiet period? Yeah, it, it will be no sooner than July the 1st that we can trigger the, okay. the standstill. Okay. And then 60 days goes by and in one scenario, they give you the thumbs up and then you roll out at a defined schedule. In another scenario, they don't or take another 60 days or whatever happens. Well, no, I would say that would be if you do that math, that's still inside of the second half of the year, even the 120 days. 
we're going to keep moving forward with our timeline that we laid out, I think, in July 2022. Right. Um, we've been hitting those dates, right? Like when we hit general availability going into Q3 last year, that was like on time. We had announced that we were doing this 1% to facilitate testing experiments. That's been on time. Yeah. So we're going to keep moving forward. I think it's important to say too, that like what we'll see, I think what the commitments say and, and the situation with the CMA, right, is they either say they have additional like competition concerns that need to be addressed right that would say like before you keep moving forward or or not so that's that's kind of what we expect to see come out of them and it's interesting their lens is competition their lens is not technology they're saying well will this reduce competition and hurt journalism and hurt newspapers and things like that uh which i think is a little bit of a different lens than the ib criticism so so let's talk about the protocols there are a lot but let's just kind of try to dumb this so it seems like the three really relevant things people need to keep their eye on right now are topics, the protected audiences, and the reporting APIs. Those are, those are the hot ones, right? Yeah, those are the three sort of what we call the ads APIs. There's actually another ads API called private aggregation, which is really cool because yeah. it's more general purpose for like reach and frequency and We've even seen like contextual companies thinking about using it for actually like evolving their own contextual offerings with aggregated cross-site signals about yeah. like, hey, this this context actually seems to perform well in, in, in this way or be related to some, you know, brand interest. Just adding the one more, you, you mentioned the reporting API, yeah. which people usually reference it's the attribution reporting api that that one has a really great name in the sense that people are like okay that one probably does attribution yeah uh, but yeah there's also private aggregation so it's like effectively four major apis that uh really are meant to support the ads use cases and then we're building other apis that are more general purpose like not just ads i was going to bring up private aggregation but i read the spec. oh cool i read the spec i didn't understand a word of it uh, oh, no. So I, uh, but what I do is I write in order in order to sound intelligent, I bring it up a lot with other people, and I say to them like I, earnestly, I say to the CEOs of other companies, you really should look into the private aggregation API. It's very powerful, and uh, they think I understand it, but I don't, which is fine. Anyway, let's talk topics first. Let's go in order. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so topics lets you uh, lets the browser give you information about topics that the user is interested in. My take on topics right now is that the reaction is sort of meh. It's not lighting anyone on fire that they could get three or four topics from the browser. There's a limit to how many you can get. It's sort of like nice to have. Uh, the original spec was highly criticized when it was very abstract and complicated. Now it's kind of simple, but not super useful. Am I reading that wrong? Are people really excited about it? I think I would say that there's not a right way to think about an API. I'll start by saying that. But okay. like, I think because it's, you know, it's meant to be a primitive that people can use in a lot of different ways. I think that the main way people have thought about it when I said people may not be thinking about it right is that they've thought about it as a semantic targeting tool. Like I'm going to go into my DSP's UI and target like golf, right? Whereas as we've been looking at like at early adopters builds on top of topics, we've seen a couple interesting things that we think are more powerful. One of which is incorporating it as a just another signal in terms of like, how are we building optimization and, and bid valuation and basically doing the data science on top of, hey, we've got all of these signals, you know, when we see this signal, in addition to, to these others, now I'm like, trying to get in, inside of uh, ML like logic. But when we see these signals with other signals, this is how it should affect our, our bid valuation and, and, and bid logic. So we've seen that. That's pretty interesting. And then we've seen recently on the sell side, actually, a few of the early adopter SSP exchanges basically offering it as an extension to deals which is really cool. I saw recently that that Mike McNeely from Index Exchange posted about how Index is actually like expanding its deals products, like using topics, which is it's, cool. So, they, so yeah, like it's, I, yeah. I think it's exciting. I get why people say like, well, this is the simple one, right? Like this is like broad interest targeting. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> before we get off topics, there's two criticisms I've heard of topics. Uh, one, 
which I don't really understand because maybe, again, I'm not a practitioner anymore, but something about the topics really favors big sites with a lot of topics. And if you're a niche site, you're basically giving away more information than you're getting. Because like if you're a site about buying a car, you already know that your users are about buying a car. Topics doesn't help you. And you're just giving information into a co-op. And then if you're a broad site, you get information the user's interested in buying a car, which is very valuable. Yeah. So I what I would say there is like at the end of the day, a publisher can decide whether or not they're feeding into topics. Right. Right. So, it's opt in on the publisher level. It, yeah. Yeah. So it, it is a there's a we're using browser permissions to be able to say like, hey, you know, we don't feel like we want to participate. I think the reason that you would is 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 what you're saying, which is we want to be a part of this more or less, you know, co-op that allows, you know, buyers who might be bidding on this signal to bid on my inventory, whether I'm a smaller site or a larger site. Right. And that's, you know, particularly if you think about that use case of like that we've actually seen DSPs building to, which is I'm going to consider it as a bid valuation mechanism and not just a specific semantic targeting mechanism. It actually just might mean somebody bids more on you. Um, it's not like, hey, they're not targeting me at all now because I've like seeded sort of like right. topics to this ecosystem. It's like, hey, maybe they're bidding more. So the other criticism, and I, I feel I actually would like to advocate this criticism. Like I'm actually saying I critique it this way, which is okay. that it's in a sense less private than the current world. Um, in the current universe, the browser doesn't provide any cross site information. And now the Chrome browser is telling people about its user's behavior. And that strikes me as against a little bit of the philosophy of making the browser more private. As a supplement to that, I'd also offer that I believe it's a bit of a security risk because as soon as you have additional data about the user, while we're still in a world that fingerprinting exists and IP addresses exist, user profiles could be made more rich based on that data without any consideration for privacy. Yeah, I would argue that if you're using cross-site identifiers today, whether those cross-site identifiers are third-party cookies and the matching that it happens to make all that work or IP addresses or whatever you're using in the realm of cross-site identifiers, you've observed, like, most likely the browsing history of a user at a very granular level across the internet already, just because of the way that we know ad tech works. So getting some less granular information about those same sites that you would have been observing stuff and and tying it to a cross-site identifier already, you're not getting any net new information. I, I get that. But philosophically, it's like the difference between like a big data broker collecting data and coding it against my social security number versus having the government itself start offering people information about me on my social security number. I think what Ari's trying to say, or correct me if I'm wrong, is you know the nature of that this is in the browser. Yeah, that makes it different. That makes you know this like not like cookies or or, or whatever it is. Like people feel something about their browser. It's their browser. This, this we're, their, we're already sliding machine. into the it's philosophical their... discussions of the strategic discussions. <laughs> we had to. We had to. Like I Eric, guess, did uh, you make it philosophical on us? Thank you. Would I guess what, I, to ask a really unfair question? Uh, would Apple ever offer this API? I can't speak for Apple. All right. All right. Uh, one last question on topics. Uh, is it true, uh, am I remembering correctly, that topics is going to be opt-in in the European Union and opt-out everywhere else on the consumer level? Yeah, so that it is a choice that we're presenting to users as a opt-in in like EEA countries. And then, yeah, it's a choice that we're presenting as an opt-out. Uh, in the rest of the world, you can you can you can see that in the code. So there's nothing, yep. no okay. new information there. Okay, let's talk about a big poppy. Um, so to start with, I would like to read you a message I received on LinkedIn. This is from an anonymous member of our community. Okay, can you get people to stop saying poppy and force them to say protected audiences API every time? I met a guy at the IEB and he was from Arkansas and he kept saying pappy, 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 and I just can't take it anymore. Wait, was it me? Because I'm from Arkansas. Oh, no. Are you calling it Pappy? You know, say it. Do you do Pappy say with it, an Arkansas Alex. accent? Because I don't know what an Arkansas accent sounds like. Man, say this it. is Pappy. Pappy. Uh, yeah, Pappy. <laughs> um, We're getting into the real information amazing. here on this podcast. This is really this is the good stuff. This is the factual part. Pappy. Right? This is the factual part. 
Yeah. So I think we we actually have several APIs that begin with PA, right? Like we mentioned private aggregation, there's protected audience. I think internally there's a debate on whether to embrace or continue just repeating the full name of it. So yeah, I guess yeah. That, like all of ad tech, you know, we've we've contributed some acronyms. Um better than the birds. Are the birds are really not working. Um but okay, so the protected audience is API. This is the big one. This is the one that has people, I would say, freaked out a little bit um, because it's so big and complicated and you can just spend some time reading the docs and try to figure out how, how it fits in. I'm not even sure where to start. Like, I guess I would, my question for you is like, what's the reaction? You've been doing a lot of tests. Critio has been involved, uh, RTB House, a bunch of others. What's the general feeling right now today about the adoption of this API? Well, you mentioned a few of the adopters. There's there's several more. One of the things that we've done is is made a place for folks who are adopting the API to publicize that. So it's it's on GitHub, so it's a little nerdy, but it's it's public in that way. People open pull requests and you can see it on GitHub. So there's quite a few DSPs. You you mentioned several that are kind of known for remarketing. Now we've, you know, uh, if you go look at that list, Yahoo's on there. They've been talking about what they're building. They're, you know, what I would call a more general purpose DSP. So it's been great to see that, like, on the buy side, more than just remarketing is is sort of being tested against the API. And that includes, I think, the the build that I understand that Yahoo is doing is, like, actually an audience extension build on top of it. So it's it's multi-purpose, right? So I think what we're seeing, right, is yes, it is complex. It is a new paradigm, and the new paradigm is about creating a way to activate your first-party data either as an advertiser or a publisher who might want to do audience extension in a way that doesn't leak cross-site data. And in order to do that in real time, some stuff has to change. But what we've really tried to do is make it so that you don't have to give up on doing open RTB and pre-bid in order to also connect into this effectively like bidding environment on the buy side, demand source on the sell side. And because we're trying to do all those things at once, I think it, it is quite complicated. We hear that, right? Like we're not, we're not oblivious to that. I think that the big thing maybe that I, as I've listened to this podcast and you've started talking more about privacy sandbox is like, what does that mean for kind of like cowerizing your bidding logic, right? You've got some bidding logic that you can kind of right. supply beforehand, some that's coming in in real time through signals you can send yourself through RTB, some stuff that's coming in real time through a key value server that you're running as a, as a bidder. That is new. Like I've worked for a DSP before. Um, like that, it, that is new and we acknowledge that. So I think it's like companies are going to have to evolve on like iterating and optimizing in that environment. And we're doing everything that we can to help. So, so let me ask you a bunch of specific questions. And um, so you've coined the phrase, the contextual auction, which is, is a little passive aggressive in my opinion. Um, because originally the way Turtle Dove was written, they said, first you'll do a contextual option where you'll, you'll give no information about the user and then you'll do the special user option in the browser. But in my mind, the, the, the so-called contextual option is really pre bid in this environment. Like basically you're going to do a full, full ass RTB option with every piece of data you have and get your best bid. It's not really contextual. It's just not sandbox and then you're going to do your sandbox auction and compare the bits is that is that accurate that is accurate and, and i guess i would throw the question back at you can you come up with a better name because i actually feel kind of the same way that it's not the best name but if you call it traditional that's kind yeah. of seems demeaning if you call it legacy same thing if you call it server side it's like well there's also pre-bit right so well, it's you call like, it rtb it could be the rtb auction yeah, but then the pre-bid folks would be like, you know, there's also pre-bid. So, right. um, okay, fine. But I just <laughs> I want to make sure we're we talking have... about the same thing. There's, we there's are. no such we thing are. as a contextual option. It's just being called that. Yeah, just to be clear, what we mean is, yes, the what happens today. Listeners, um, you should at Alex, uh, give him some new name suggestions. Yeah, absolutely. Let's come up with a new name for the contextual option. Um, to rewrite a bunch of docs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you've never done that before. Um, so... 
Next question. When you put a user into one of these audience segments, uh, there's a limit of a thousand per bidder, it seems, right? Is that accurate? Is it a thousand per bidder or a thousand per advertiser bidder? Yeah. So I actually need to check on the exact number. So I don't want to say the wrong number and be okay. recorded. There is a limit. Yeah. I think a lot of people have maybe been thinking about the limit wrong okay. in the sense that uh, as, as we've seen people actually building to the APIs, what they're actually doing with interest groups is basically saying, hey, when I tag up an advertiser site, it's effectively just going to be one interest group for that advertiser, right? Not a thousand for that advertiser. It's like one interest group for that advertiser that can contain that site's worth of data for like the user as it traverses that advertiser, right? So I think the the interest group itself, like the actual storage size is quite large and you can put a, a goodly amount of information in there that your bidding logic can right. react to. So yeah, I think that sort of like, well, there's not enough, you know, this this limit could could crimp my style. I think there's a, a different approach that we're seeing people no. take that, you know, for instance, we're getting, you know, the earliest adopters are those who have these massive sort of like remarketing product right. listing ads kind of list. Pretty certainly has more than a and, thousand customers. And they're able, yeah, and they're able to to use this. So I think, yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's like on first glance, you're like, wait, what? And then you start digging in and you're like, oh, I can use it this way and accomplish right. sort of what I'm trying to pull off. Yeah. So uh, the two things that came to mind were one was large scale data tech companies may have more than a thousand customers. So it seems like they would hit a limit right away. Um, and the second thing that came up was that if you wanted to in any way you replicate the capabilities of what we currently call third party data, you would run through the limit very quickly. Like if, imagine a third party who's brokering data wanted to set segments in the domain of a DSP and say these are, you know, whatever, high income individuals, these are low income individuals, these are blah, blah, blah. They would have to do that effectively for every every data segment per DSP and you'd quickly run out of the thousand. Yeah. We haven't yeah. seen anyone actually run into this yet. So like I'm okay. I'm curious. I'm curious if the workaround that I'm talking about, which is not really a workaround, it's just a different way of using it, is is the reason. Clearly we need to clarify that because I think what you're what you're bringing up is a a valid point that, hey, if if it's not clear to me that I can support all of my advertiser customers yeah. with this setup, that's not a great first starting point. So we need to definitely work on clarifying that because I think that this is one of those places where being very clear is is important, like up front, so people don't just walk away because they think, oh, this doesn't support my use case. So, so one thing that I noted in the documents was that you're creating a totally new tech stack, and yet... The use cases are very aligned to the current business models of the company in the mm -hmm. current tech stack. You have a role for an SSP, you have a role for a DSP, for a publisher, for a publisher ad server. And I wonder if you like basically if were forced to shoehorn that, because if you build a protocol that, for example, didn't require an SSP to exist, you would have made a lot of enemies. Yet when I read the documents, um, I'm getting to a question at some point. Um, I don't see that an SSP has much of a role here in in a Pappy auction. Uh, they effectively create, they have a list of eligible bidders. That's about it. I mean, they also do some cleanup on ad quality, things that could probably be pretty easily done somewhere else. Tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah. So first, I would just say in terms of roles being in the API, when you look at our documentation, like we actually are taking the feedback that, hey, it you need to help us map our business to these APIs. So we've actually started saying, right, like this is, you know, sort of where an SSP could sit in protected audience. This is where a DSP could sit. So I, I, I hear you that it now seems like, hey, there's like roles built into the APIs. The APIs are primitives, though, and like don't understand the roles themselves in the sense that like they're just pieces of technology that anyone can call the APIs. So that, that's the first thing I would say. Second thing I would say is if we didn't build something that supported today's roles, we're not going to get adoption. And 
we want adoption, right? Like we want adoption because we actually believe these APIs are more private for users. And if these APIs work for ad tech companies and and the companies that they support, there's less likely over time to rely on more covert forms of cross-site tracking. So there's like a desire for people to build to this stuff. And if we don't support those roles, like, that's not great for adoption. Yeah. On the, that you had another piece of your question, which was like the role on the sort of scoring side of an auction. What I would say is the companies who are building the, on the exchange side to integrations into protected audience are, are building a lot of stuff. Right. <laughs> They're building, you, you mentioned like they're obviously scoring. You can, in your scoring logic, you can put in commercial logic. You mentioned ad quality. You can put in ad quality and other publisher control logic that's coming out of a key value server. You're also deciding when you want to participate and how and what information you're actually sending in to that auction in the same way that like there's effectively a request coming from what's called auction signals and seller signals inside of this container that is protected audience. So in a lot of ways, it looks like what they're doing today in OpenRTB and with Prebid. I guess I would challenge you it, like, to talk to some SSPs who are building, exchanges who are building, and see if their build is small sure. or big. Yeah, I, And well, most you of were them on, will probably say it's big. You were on stage at the, at the Edit Changer event. And, sure. or, no, no, or was it, it wasn't the Edit Changer event. It was the IP on web event. And you were asked, the build complexity and you said i think you said tell me if i'm wrong ssp was medium dsp was extra large is that am i quoting you correctly relative to one another i think the build is larger for a dsp particularly a performance dsp so that that's just like relative okay i wouldn't want any pm who's listening to be like oh i'm just gonna size my normal medium yes right it's not your normal medium I'm so happy to not run a DSP right now. Um, okay, let's uh, let's shift into the philosophical stuff. We're gonna uh, you can read about the report or, uh, left of the reader. There's a lot of okay. We're gonna try to get through all this. So first, let's take consumer perspective. Uh, Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, he tweeted about a month ago something along the lines of "Switch your browser." Google's turning Chrome into a privacy destroying monster. Paraphrasing someone to get the exact quote. Uh, why should consumers be happy about this? Yeah. So what I would say, like our overall aim, if we had to like talk to a consumer like directly about this, which we do, (laughs) is to make it possible for you to see a relevant ad without your browsing history leaking out of a secure browsing environment. Right. So like and you might jump to really quickly, like, well, I might not want to see relevant ads. And what I would what I would say to those users is. We want to keep your browsing experience free, and we understand that free content is supported by digital advertising. We need to acknowledge that that access to free content is funded by businesses that are willing to pay for attention, right? So, like, again, you can see relevant advertising without your browsing history leaking out of a a secure, like, browsing environment is the change for a user. Okay, well... I mean, I, I think that's a tough, tough conversation to have. Like, if you think sure. about the way Tim Cook introduced ATT, he basically is like, stop the ads from following me around. And that's what consumers experience. OK, let's talk about the industry body, because um, I, I do want to cover a lot of topics. Um, you've been from the start really embracing d- the W3C and industry bodies. But there's no sign that any of these standards are going to be adopted by anybody besides the Chrome team. So why does it matter that it's part of an industry body? And or is there anyone looking to adopt this besides Chrome team? Yeah. So the reason it matters that there's industry bodies involved, I hope is apparent, which is we don't want to throw this stuff over the wall, right? We want to take in feedback, whether that feedback is from other browsers, the W3C itself as an organization, through the folks who've been showing up. Uh, from the ad tech side, from the publisher side, from the agency side at those those groups. So like it is a great forum for discussing with all of those groups, right? 
and it's not the only forum we're in, but like you asked specifically about W3C. As far as what other browsers are doing, right, I can't speak for them. What I can say is that, you know, long before I even joined Google, I've been attending for the last four years as many of these W3C calls as possible. And the other browsers are actually leaning in on measurement. And I think there's decent progress. It's not fast enough, but there's decent progress towards a an attribution standard going on. That's exciting. So, yeah, it is exciting. I don't think, like I mentioned, the, the speed at which that is moving is is browser standard speed. Right. Um, it is not abnormal for individual browsers to go launch something ahead of everyone else doing it. Um, we've also been clear. I'm happy to share this doc if you still do show notes. I, I know you've mentioned that before, but uh, we we published a position about a year ago on sort of the alternate measurement proposals. That's like, hey, look, we welcome this. We've been working on it with these browsers. Like, if the industry decides that this is the way that they really want to go, like we could go that way. It's just we're not going to wait. Yeah. On on that to happen. So, so in I think, theory, you could be in a world. 10 years from now, let's say where, you know, SCAD network from Apple and whatever Chrome is implemented are compatible in some way. I think that would be ideal, right? Because the, for ad tech in terms of building to these APIs, you get way more bang for your buck for the advertiser. If we're talking about measurement, right? Like in the agency, you get something consistent across platforms. So that would be ideal. Let's talk about now. Let's get to the juicy stuff. So, Jed Dedrick, the CRO of the Trade Desk, he posted a really nice comment on LinkedIn yesterday. I don't know if you're connected to him, maybe you're friends. He said, quote, this is the entire LinkedIn post. The privacy sandbox is an embarrassment. The entire LinkedIn post. Uh, this is after their, like, I don't know, 10,000-word essay about how you were not in the spirit of NASA and it could be rocket science, but you're not doing I didn't really get the point of that essay. But the Trade Desk seems a little negative on this whole subject. I guess what I'll turn that around. I don't want you to comment on the trade desk. First of all, are you doing okay? Like, what? Like, are you like, you know, hitting the bottle after work? Like, what? What's a day in the life like? Oh man, that was an interesting turn. <laughs> um, I, I will tell you. I guess I'm a little weird. About six years ago, I got introduced to this this intersection of of privacy and digital advertising when I was at AppNexus, and I have not looked back. And I will tell you, I get frustrated at times, but I quickly back out to like, I love working on this issue. It's super gnarly. I'm very tired, but like in a good way. Right. <laughs> and I managed to go skiing with my dad this weekend after not having done so in eight years. So, uh, nice. well, which, which just him, I should say. Uh, so we, yeah, I'm, I'm finding time for me. Um, but I'm, I actually enjoy it. Let me turn it around to a very specific question, which is the trade desk is, betting its future, it seems, on hashed emails, what's called UID2, and several other parties are. Is there anything fundamentally incompatible with that and the sandbox? Do they, put it another way, and I've heard this from people, it's like, do they have to worry that once you're done with this sandbox project in 2024 and cookies go away, that in the, nature, in the name of privacy, you're going to come after hashed emails? What I would say is that since 2019, when Privacy Sandbox launched, the stated aim was to reduce cross-site tracking, is to reduce cross-site tracking, right? I think the way that we state our mission, right, is to keep users' behavior private across a free and open internet. And that across piece is, is important, right? So I think the way that we're approaching our work is reduce cross-site tracking. And there are many forms of that, which third-party cookies are the most pervasive, I guess, on the web. But there are other forms too. The second thing I will say is, and I think there may be groans as people listen to, <laughs> listen to this, we have been taking a measured approach, which means that we broadcast what we're planning long before we do something. And that is intentional, and we will keep doing that. So what you see now in terms of what we're building is like giving people a lay of the land of like right. what our roadmap is. 
so yeah, I, I that so that's I, what I can say to that. So IP addresses are next in the bullet in the crosshairs, but cro- hams are not. Uh, reading between the lines here. If we do something on email, we will talk about it long before. Okay, got it. <laughs> long before it happens. Uh, all right, let's talk IAB. So the IAB came out with a very lengthy report uh, that was pretty, I would call it negative, uh, pretty negative about the sandbox. They had a task force working that you were not involved in. Google, meaning, was not involved in. And they said things like, of the 44 basic digital advertising use cases analyzed by the IAB Tech Labs over the past few months, only a small handful remain feasible using the sandbox. They call out things like multi-touch attribution, CPA advertising, competitive exclusions, blah, 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 blah. And then they have some specific criticism that we'll walk through with you. Um, now, you haven't yet replied. I, I assume we should expect a full reply, what, next week? Yep. Good, good. Uh, you're working over the weekend. Tough job. Someone give this guy a high-performance review. So, um, okay, so the basic, uh, let's start big picture. Should the sandbox support every use case that is currently supported by third-party cookies? The short answer is no. Yeah, well, that, was, that was an easy question for you. Tell me why. You said we were getting into philosophical stuff. Philosophically, I think the way that we're approaching what we're doing <laughs> is to build building blocks that can support advertiser and publisher outcomes. There are lots of different tactics that over the last 30 years in digital advertising, folks have come up with to support advertiser and publisher goals, <laughs> tactics, right? Like we think those tactics can change right? They've, they've changed over time. We think they can continue to change. And if we're focused on, hey, can we offer primitives or like APIs that building blocks that support, you know, things like underlying things like showing a relevant ad, measuring an ad, you're going to be able to pull off what advertisers and publishers expect you, of you, but maybe in a different way. The other philosophical part is we're not trying to recreate like rampant cross-site tracking. So some of the feedback right in that in that report doesn't seem like it's taking into account the constraint that we have in our designs which is we don't want to create something that the outputs of which allow easy re-identification of a user across sites. So yeah, there's there's some philosophical difference there. And that was the the longer expanded answer to like, no, yeah. we're not going to recreate every single tactic yeah. that exists today. Okay. So let, I'm going to go through their criticism. They, they, in their summary, they effectively had a bunch of criticisms. I'm going to, I'm going to shorten them a little bit. Uh, let's just rapid fire through them. Number one, okay. the, do, the documents have been inconsistent, have changed too much. It's hard to read, blah, blah, blah. Reaction? Yeah. There are a lot of documents. I think where we're at right now is the transition from where we were the last three years, which was like active proposals that were evolving. And that's it. That is a documentation style in and of itself. Like, how do you support this active? And and a lot of it lived on GitHub for that reason. So you could see track how things were changing. There's easy commentability. You can see who's saying what. We're shifting from that to, uh, by the way, I'm moving for folks who are listening and, yeah. and, and shifting over. There's a lot we're of hand motions going on here. We're shifting from that to a, hey, look, we've got a stable set of APIs that can be used. It's still going to evolve over time, but we want those fully documented. We've actually just soft launched a unified developer site across Chrome and Android where all of the API docs will live. I say soft launch because we've been moving stuff both from the Chrome and Android documentation sort of centers, but also pulling in what's on GitHub to build out documentation. I right. like I still acknowledge that's a lot to read and we've got more to do in terms of making it more approachable. But what we've been doing, like any product and engineering team will do, you know, in early stage is like leaning in with early adopters, like being in the room with them helping them through. And what we see is after you get over the initial hurdle of like, wow, this is a different paradigm, you actually start and you can see this actually in people today because they're active commenters on like GitHub and they show up at all the meetings. They're like suggesting really technical stuff 
that indicates to me it is possible to learn this yeah. stuff. It's just, it's hard. We, yeah, we, I mean, we acknowledge news, it's hard. If you've ever looked for documentation on the very basics of how GAM works, you're ahead of GAM. And GAM is a, is a 20 year old product. Your documentation is vastly better than pretty much anything else Google's put out. So, uh, number two, the browser is not a commercial entity. This is the argument that if something goes wrong, this is in the IB, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the IB report. If something goes wrong and like an ad doesn't serve, in the current paradigm, you have someone you can call. You can say, hey, why did the ad not work? In the new paradigm, the ad just didn't serve and no one could tell. Any thoughts about that? Yeah. In the end, like I, I wouldn't view what we're doing as drastically different from relying on platforms in between like right. what you're doing today, right? Like you're you're relying on server infrastructure that's running open yes. source code, right? Like at the end of the day, we're building a platform. And in this model, right, if you think about it, you're still deciding whether to call the APIs. You're deciding what to put into the APIs in terms of like the information that you put in there. As far as like observing why something may not be working, I think we are building a lot of debugging yeah. <laughs> into what we're doing and and being very thoughtful about how to do that while preserving privacy. I wouldn't view this as as different from like and and maybe look at like which companies have built so far to the APIs and which companies have run a process on on recontracting. I think we haven't seen companies running a big process on recontracting. Uh, so I'm not sure, like, you kind of have to look to the company's building, uh, right. like, are they deciding to do that? And if they're not, number, uh, let me move on. So number three, uh, it's actually three and four, which is, um, can't be audited and can't be certified. So the current media ecosystem in the U S is, uh, audited by a company or certified by the MRC. We had, uh, George Ivey on the show, I don't know, I heard. a couple months ago. So is there any plan to allow the sandbox technology to be audited? So it can't like allow is probably the wrong word here. Like it can be it's in Chromium, which is open, like it's it's documented and you can go see the code in Chromium. I think bigger picture, the privacy enhancing technologies aren't like a subject matter space solely to Chrome, right? We're seeing companies like data clean rooms and like data collaboration platforms, privacy enhancing technology based companies starting to support, not just starting to, there's been some that have been around for a while, right. like measurement, like and collaboration between multiple parties. I think, you know, it's an interesting thing that maybe Tech Lab and IAB, I, I know that I just saw an email this morning that like, They've announced some guidelines for AR. Right. That's um, all that too. Yeah. And I think this is kind of the same thing, right? It's like privacy enhancing technologies are a thing and they're not going to be not a thing because right. we're seeing regulation become more, more. We're seeing regulation grow on privacy. And I think, yeah, it's an opportunity for the ecosystem to say, what do we want? you know, the components of private advertising technologies to look like as far as accreditation goes. So yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. And I, I, I think there's a great place actually for IAB and IAB Tech Lab to to help drive that. They've got a pets working group, um, pets being private, yeah, privacy enhancing technologies. So yeah, I'm it's kind of like moving from the paradigm of having a log of every single thing that happened to having to not having a log. Well it's gonna be harder to guarantee interesting yeah. question how you would if, if you were a mobile app ad network and you're charging a cpa basis could you rely on the att reporting uh or sorry the scan reporting um for a billable event um that's an interesting problem but let's move on let's move on so two more the next was generally scalability so the run it basically this criticism that you know the the protected audits api is going to run you know, thousands of little servlets on every page and it's going to slow down. It may not work. And the corollary that they broke it out into another question, which is if a browser gets over capacity, is it going to start losing bids and otherwise manipulate the auction in unpredictable ways? Yeah. So what we've done is taken the same, like we actually very much learned from ad tech 
folks that have been showing up for the last four years at W3C, we've taken the same approach that is taken in real-time bidding, which is provide controls for both sides to effectively like timeouts there. So like I can have timeouts on my end as, as a seller. I can have on the buy side, actually, I can have pretty sophisticated logic on prioritization of like groups that I'm bidding on. So one thing is just like take a page from how the ecosystem has done it so far to give people tools and controls on buy side, sell side over speed. Second piece is we actually very much as Chrome, like this is speaking as Chrome, right? Like want the browser to be fast. I work with a lot of engineers who care about that deeply. And we've got a whole long laundry list of things that we've done in even the last year to increase performance in terms of just like lower latency in how the architecture and the system works. So that's two. The third thing is we actually have like, this is not news. We have been working on which components of something like protected audience could also sit in trusted execution environments. So confidential computing environments and actually offload or horizontal scale like the if you're wanting to do super sophisticated bidding like into a trusted execution environment where you can also be making server to server calls between sort of buyer and seller so we're we're taking that re- we're taking latency really seriously um like there's a multi-prong approach and i think that the the thing to remember is like our incentive is for this to be as fast as possible. We want users to one trust the browser, but also have a good experience on the browser. So yeah, it, yeah. this will be something that we continually watch and and evolve and pay attention to. So yeah, I, it's it's good feedback. I think there, there's lots of good feedback in the IB report. By the way, it's just there's also some stuff that we think is is inaccurate, and we're going to be providing information to right like provide a clearer picture to folks next week. Okay, so last point, and maybe the one that comes up the most, and it came up in the CMA also, is governance. So there's a feeling like, you know, Google has, the Chrome team has been engaging with people, it's been very open, et cetera. But effectively, at the end of this process, we're handing over the keys to the car to the way advertising works to the world's largest advertising company. And what happens if a year from now, Google decides to not allow hashed emails or to remove IP addresses or to do whatever it does. And I'm going to just throw in a little editorial here, which is there's a little bit of a history here on the ad side. You know, if you look at the Department of Justice complaint against Google on the ad tech side, um, there's sort of a pattern of Google changing the rules in various ways that did not benefit the publishers. Um, so there's a little bit of a paranoia, I would say about this particular subject. I don't mean to disparage you or your team that you would do something dishonest or self-dealing, but there is some history there on the ad side. What what could you say to either to move the governance out of Google? Is there any plan of doing that? Or secondly, what can you say to allay concerns about handing the keys to the car to Google? Yeah. One thing that is clear and out in the open right now is actually, and I think you read the latest report, CMA is actually focused on like consultation with us around the question of governance and stewardship of the APIs. So that's like something actively in discussion. So I like that's out there, that's public. What I would say besides that is we, there's a couple things. One, we actually, the commitments to the CMA continue lasting even after third party cookie deprecation. They go until 2028. So in terms of the things that you see today, like, for instance, that report that you read, we put out a report every quarter. I think ad tech just now noticed that we do that, but we've been doing that since 2022. Put out a report report every quarter with feedback that we're getting, how we're responding to that feedback. Some of that feedback is really tough. Uh, CMA will, you know, share what it's focused on and its reaction to our report. So that that continues um, with the commitments. And I think as far as like, from a go forward standpoint, we understand that it is super important 
to have the ecosystem and the ecosystem is more than ad tech and advertisers and agencies, but the ecosystem at the table discussing things in the open, us sharing our perspectives out in the open in documentation, right? Like that's critical to the success of this project, whether there's commitments or not. So I think what you'll see of us going forward is continuing to do like what we're doing now. And yeah, I, I, I realize for some people who can't spend all of their time at W3C, that that does put trust in other organizations to to be a representative voice for them. Again, back to like IAB Tech Lab, I think there are, could be a great forum to represent sort of the ads ecosystem as we move forward as a voice like in public dialogue. What I what I would like to see change though on that front is that it's less of a waterfall. Right, right. right. Where it's like, let's create a report for five months and then hand it off. And and like I I think and I think that's gonna I think that's gonna change. Like as as we've seen their public comments about this, I think now they're like opening up to, hey, let's pull these guys in and ask questions. We've gotten this initial stuff off our chest. So yeah, I think we are going to continue engaging in the in the ecosystem, and for those who are skeptical of that, like we we actually still will remain committed to the commitments that we have that goes past third party cookie deprecation. All right, let's call it there. This is a, a long episode, Eric. I didn't let you talk at all, but you know, sorry, I geeked out here. Um, so, Alex, we're going to uh, thank you so much for being here, um, and then we're going to take a quick break, and then Eric and I will do the news of the week. There's a lot of a lot of news off earnings reports, et cetera, um, and I'll also probably give my opinions about this whole conversation in our newsletter next week. So, again, Alex, thank you for your frank and uh, detailed conversation. Yeah, thank you too for having me. Uh, very much look forward to listening to more episodes. I think a lot of people on our team really enjoy your podcast. So thanks for putting it out there. Well, great. Glad to hear. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. This podcast is sponsored by Flash Talking. And in case you didn't hear, they've got a Super Bowl ad. Wait, can I say Super Bowl or do I have to say big game? I don't know. Okay, well, Flash Talking's got a big game ad. You can check it out at flashtalking.com slash big game. You'll also find a hidden camera prank with Improv Everywhere and other fun marketing to unleash the power of creative and make ads people want to see. So go to flashtalking.com slash big game for more. And I got to say it, this ad could have been an email. And we're back. I didn't say anything for a good hour. So I'll give uh, Ari uh, a break here uh, from his voice talking about his uh, his favorite topic. And then we'll uh, we'll dive into the news in the week. Uh, there was a ton of news uh, over the course of the past week. Um, maybe we start with earnings. How does that sound? Sounds great. All right, cool. Two earnings reports to note. I think the first one was uh, was Critio. So they had relatively flat revenue. So you know, five sixty six million in Q four versus five sixty four year over year. But there were some interesting things going on under the surface. So the num- number one thing was, um, you know, it's now a you know half, almost half retail media. Uh, according to Megan, um, 200 million of that was uh, was retail media, which um, I think is great in terms of showing the growth trajectory. Um, but I think it's also like, for some reason, this number in my mind keeps banging around of like retail media being a $130 billion business by, I don't know, like that's crazy next number. year. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, th- this, this thing has just become fact. So um, I think it also puts into perspective um, how much uh, how much growth I think th- there is ahead for, you know, non- uh, Amazon, non Walmart retail media, but then on the other side, just how big Amazon and, and Walmart are. But you know, undoubtedly, they're 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 driving you know the the most revenue from a, a, a open web perspective. Was um, was two hundred gross or net? I would assume it maps uh, to gross um, media, whatever. Yeah, whatever the five sixty six number was. So I would assume it's gross. Profits were up big though. Yeah. So in Q four of twenty two, it was sixteen million profits. So it was sixty four million. Um, in Q4 of uh, 23, so that's big, um, and the, the the stock popped as a as a result. I think apropos of the conversation we just had, they estimate in the second half of this year, 30 to 40 million dollar uh, top line revenue loss due to uh, due to cookie deprecation. You know, I think you know getting out of ahead of it is important from a public company perspective, and then also if you think about you know in in two half in two H of this year, you know assuming a little bit of growth. 
It's a $1.2 billion second half, you know, relatively modest in terms of the forecasted loss. It sounds like just round numbers. They're, they're thinking it takes a 10 to 15% haircut off of their return. Right. Which is maybe less than expected, uh, uh, you know, between alternative yeah. IDs and sandbox that they've been leaning into. I, I think it's good for the stock, good for Critio. It's great to see them try to manage through this where, you know, a couple of years ago, people were saying this stock's a dead man walking. By no means I, would you say that today. Yeah, the stock's up a bunch. Yeah, yeah. I think it popped uh, 20%. The other thing that they mentioned was um, they're advocating for companies to lean into privacy sandbox. Yeah. So taking a, a, a much different stance, uh, maybe not much different stance than TTD, because TTD is, you know, has been saying that they're going to test everything out. But, yeah. you know, I think being a bit less um, uh, antagonistic, so to speak. Yeah. So TTD is being very antagonistic. I love to see it. Yeah. keeps the podcast interesting. <laughs> exactly. Uh, other big one that uh, you know, it's 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 so funny that you know that now this has become you know an ad tech uh, earnings watch is um is Uber. Yeah, yeah. So you know, last year they you know w- when you interviewed uh, Dr. Mark um, in April, they were at a five hundred million dollar run rate according to Dara in uh, in in last night's or last week's report. It's already at a nine hundred million dollar plus run rate um, in Q four. So you know they're just like crushing it. Ripping the, the, the cover off the ball. Yeah, yeah. I think there was, um, you know, something interesting uh, below that uh, was they now have 500,000 advertisers. So that's up 75% year over year. So it's interesting, you know, it's twofold. So, you know, number one, they are going after the Google meta playbook, which is, you know, going after small advertisers while I was just still, you know, being able to, you know, super serve the large ones. And then I saw in in one of his quotes, uh, Dara said that the average SMB sees a, an eight x uh, ROAS on Uber advertising. So wow. you know if if that's at all close to you know what 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 the true number is. I mean they're they're going to just continue to crush. Yeah. As a reminder, their their bread and butter is this endemic advertising where the Uber Eats restaurant is folded right into a monetization program. So they get they're making money on the Uber Eats deliveries and then. They get upsold to promoting those deliveries. So it's a really great model. Uh, I'd also point out that the interview I did is still very relevant and is still free. If you go to Architecture TV, there's a section for free content, and that interview is fully free uh, to registered users. Yep. Um, so that's that's the earnings recap. Uh, a couple of uh, super interesting things going on um, with CTV. I think there were there were three things we should we should hit on quickly. The first was, I mean, obviously yesterday this news dropped that there's a new sports uh, streaming co-op powered by uh, or, or a, a, a three way JV of Disney, Fox, uh, Warner Brothers Discovery. So yeah. um, that one I think is super interesting. Yeah, people are really scratching their heads. People don't know what to make of this. Um, it's obviously important, but how exactly it's going to play out. I think the only thing that's for sure is there'll be a new offering, like a Hulu for sports kind of offering you can subscribe to and get access to a lot of this content. But will they jointly bid on the rights in some way? And how it will how will it interact with the rights discussions is kind of a big question because they're under obviously a lot of press, these traditional media companies, that they might get outbid on rights by the Amazons and Apples of the world. And yeah. so teaming up might be their way around that. Yeah, that's exactly how how I interpreted it. Um, but I think it's also just like okay. interesting when you take a step back. I read that uh, you know there's like half as many cable subscribers uh, now versus just a you know a, a few years ago. And you know what keeps uh, many folks um, paying for cable is sports, right? So now if this is like a real way to access sports in a streaming environment, I think it's both a little bit of offense and, and defense. Um, but super it's all, it's all the ESPN problem for Disney. Yeah, they, they were they're really struggling about would they come out with ESPN Plus or not? Because if they came out with it, they'd get all the super sports enthusiasts to use it, and they would lose all their their fees that they get from the cable companies. So maybe this is the way around that. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, another thing, you know, again, sort of th- this this turned into the news. Um, so Neil Mohan, uh, CEO of um, uh, of YouTube, you know, kind of you know, for- former longtime uh, Google ad tech I- exec, he had like a really interesting, yeah. good, you know, kind of recap blog post. Um, we highlighted just a few, you know, kind of key stats and, and some areas of focus. A lot of it is around AI, so I recommend everybody uh, take a take a read of it. But the one thing that was interesting is this stat that YouTube is now the fourth largest MVPD in the U.S. with eight million subscribers. That's like jaw dropping, but also makes sense because YouTube TV is awesome. 
Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Um, my uh, I used to work for Neil and um, Chris Nostlin is the head PM there, and I used, he used to work for me actually at Google. And it's amazing what they've accomplished here. It gives them a lot of power uh, as an MVPD. They have to negotiate the rates with all the channels, and uh, this gives them more of a leg up. There's also some interesting commentary about the fact that YouTube TV is US only currently, and maybe there's an opportunity outside. Um, yeah. So definitely something to watch. Um, and it's great to see a bunch of ad tech people um, expand their scope and do something that actually matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally cr- crushing it. And then, sort of f- final uh, C- CTV news, um, and you know, connecting to uh, U.S. versus uh, the opportunity outside of the U.S. Um, you actually found this. There was a, a, a announcement, um, an article in Ad Age that um, Expedia is going to run a global ad campaign on Netflix. Um, yeah, it's running in nine countries. So, you know, all of a sudden now this is a way to access global TV audiences at, at scale via via Netflix. Yeah, Netflix has this hidden advantage, or it's not hidden, but people right. don't talk about it enough, that they're really a global company. And, right. you know, being able to retrieve content from a market like Korea and get Squid Game when probably that wasn't on the radar of most of the other media companies. And now the opposite, to be able to offer advertisers cross-country campaigns if you think about the companies we usually think of, like Disney, Comcast, et cetera, they really just don't have a global footprint for the most part. They may have little areas where they can go across countries, but Netflix is a native global company. You know, I don't know exactly how many countries they're in, but it's like 70, 90, 100, something like that. Yeah. And uh, they can sell ads in all of them. Pretty yeah. exciting. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, maybe, maybe final one we'll, we'll hit on um, is uh, this uh, Apple VR device, AR device, uh, the uh, the the Vision Pro. Um, did you get one? No, I'm pretty shocked you didn't show up to record with one. <laughs> I thought like that was what venture capitalists do. They just like go out and get the shiny new toy and then opine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think our 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 uh, our buddies at the All In Pod they 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 said, oh yeah, Jason went and bought bought one for each each of them. Yeah, might have been a joke. Um, <laughs> it's getting. It, I'm, I'm surprised how good the reviews are. The reviews yeah. are are universally you know shining, saying this is an amazing thing, a game changing device. But they're also saying that no one would ever use it as it currently stands. So the question everyone has is, how many years is it going to take to reduce the weight and increase the battery life and that's a very interesting technical problem i'm sure they're fake but some of these videos um and gifs of of people uh wearing these out in the in the wild whether it's like the guy crossing the street while like typing and moving things or the guy on the subway or the guy squatting 225 yeah <laughs> I mean, like it's pretty funny. i was i was yeah I, I was rolling but you're you're exactly right um you know a couple of people mentioned like right away that the the weight of it made it um really difficult to uh to sit and you know work for for a long period of time but you yeah could, I, you I can imagine a quick recommendation alex Kantrowitz has a great podcast right. called big tech and this week they do apple and they have john gruber on and they talk about this among other issues it's a really excellent episode so I'd yeah, yeah, for sure. But, you know, I think you can kind of look at this and see a glimpse into the future, that the future, wow. you know, of these uh, wearable devices or um, or glasses or, or lenses is, you know, more AR than VR, um, you know, number one. And then, you know, number two, bringing it home to, you know, our conversations around, around ads, um, you know, I think it becomes kind of interesting because you have new surfaces, you have location, you got a lot of interesting things that um, yeah. can, can potentially be marketing, you know, kind of applications, but man, I thought like voice would be more of a thing from an ads perspective a few right. years ago. That didn't happen. Didn't happen. I thought that AR VR would, you know, be further along just given, you know, all of the all of the stuff that we've seen, you know, with with other devices and, you know, Snap, but like that didn't happen. So I have been, you know, like twice bitten and tempering my enthusiasm for what what, what we might see over the short term, but man, it it looks really cool. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. It's hard to predict some of this stuff. Uh, but if if a AR-type device became widely used, the advertising implications are just absolutely awesome. You know, from yeah. being able to overlay information around restaurants and stores to being able to see products in three dimensions before you buy them, um, games, et cetera. There's just so many, but it's very early. And when you play with early stuff, you get burned. Can we talk about the Premion news? I'm just so excited. This is like one of those stories no one cares about except for me. 
Need to talk about it. Have at it. Okay, Premion, which is a over-the-top at CTV uh, trading house that's owned by one of the big cable companies. They bought a DSP called Octillion. You've probably never heard of Octillion. It's a very small DSP. Whatever. Great. Nice little acquisition. I don't think the price was disclosed. Why is this yeah, a, it was an not. interesting story? This is an interesting story because if you turn back time six months ago, there was a big investment in a company called Bad Hive, where Goldman Sachs put a very high valuation on this company. I, I, I think seven hundred fifty million valuation, hundred million invest. I might have the number not exactly right. What Bad Hive does is they help support trade desks for cable companies. Their biggest right. customer, Premion. So hmm. it appears that that investment has been significantly. Uh, impacted uh, because Premion's in housing, what effectively is a pretty simple technology. Being able to run a trade desk that's effectively on its extension for a cable company, not very difficult. I know because Beeswax had it, did this for Comcast. Comcast was Beeswax's biggest customer before Comcast acquired it. Um, so this takes it all full circle. Cable companies in housing, uh, and by cable companies, it's going to be telecom companies, anyone who offers an advertising service or small mid-side advertisers in housing, making it their own. Um, the mar- large margins have a tendency to be decreased by the people paying them. And I'd be interested if anyone wants to tell me I'm wrong about this story, but it seems like it's a pretty juicy one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did a quick check. Uh, Madhive was 300 on a billion. All right. Yeah. Love those valuations. So- Exactly. Uh, so this has been our longest episode ever. Um, yep. I'm so excited we had Alex on. I'm so excited to see you, you your sort of kind of write up on this, this since this is such a, a passion project for yours. Um, but thanks you, thank you everybody for listening. Um, send us uh, your feedback. Smash that like and subscribe button, and we will see you next week. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you for subscribing to Architecture. New interviews are added every week at Architecture.tv and your favorite podcasting app.